the set point, the desired value, and the measurement. Okay, all of those are a function of time. The controller is trying to make this error zero, right? Because if the error is zero, that means your measurement is equal to the set point. That's what you want. That's the best you can do. Okay. So the goal of the controller is trying to drive this error to zero. So the controller will operate usually on the difference between these two signals, which isn't really shown here. That's how it usually works. Um, okay. All right, so what do we, generically, what are we trying to do with control? There's two kind of problems. Okay. Probably I'll talk about this problem first. Okay. The typical thing in a plant, and it doesn't, well, let, at this point I'm kind of talking about continuous manufacturing, so this would be a, you know, commodity chemicals or any kind of continuous process here. <coughs> How does this work? Well, you start up the plant, right? And once you start up the plant, your goal is to operate the plant at some predetermined steady state for as long as possible, or until you're going to switch to some different product or something like that. So, it'll be a scenario like this. Here's the output, here's time, here's the set point, constant, not changing, okay? The problem is that the process of the plant subject to disturbances, so if this is like, um, let's say, temperature of the reactor, that's not going to change for a particular product, but you might have impurities in the feed or catalyst might deactivate, and the temperature will tend to drop or increase. Okay. So the idea of the controller is to try to you know, keep this output as close to this set point as possible. Set point's not changing. Okay. That's called disturbance rejection. Disturbances are causing the output to deviate from the set point. You don't usually know what those disturbances are, but you can see their effect. And the controller's goal is to try to drive that error to zero. Um, we call this disturbance rejection. Sometimes in the control list, we call it regulation. Okay. That's the most common scenario. The second possibility is what we call set point tracking. There could be two different possibilities here. Here's the output and here's time. And you might decide that, you, you, so you're in a plant, you're making a product. You might decide, we'd like to increase the production rate. Okay. Because we, we think we can make more product and we can sell it. So we're going to increase the production rate. The idea of, of the controller then is to try to take, so right, the controller is keeping the output near here, and then at some point it realizes, oh, the set point's been changed, 25% increase in production. The controller's job is to try to, you know, get the, get the production rate up there and keep it there. So it's trying to track this set point, oh, set point tracking. Okay. <coughs> that again would be a continuous kind of manufacturing problem. You guys talk in any class about um, batch processes? No? Okay, you, you did batch chemical reactors. Way, right. So I don't know if you learned when you talked about batch chemical reactors that um, typically you operate those with a time bearing policy, like the temperature that you want to operate the reactor changes and you can calculate. You, I'm sure you didn't do this with a model, like what's the best temperature trajectory to take to maximize yield and things like that. So typically, if you were in a, a batch process, you might have some predetermined temperature profile that you're trying to track. This has been pre-calculated. Okay. And then the controller's job is you know, to try to keep the temperature near this predetermined set point. Okay. Both those are set point tracking problems. And sometimes in the literature they call this survey. But we won't do we we'll this in case you see it. Okay. So that's nice, right? You might want to do this, you might want to do this, you might want to do this. So um, what I'm trying to convince you here is that there's limits to how well you can do it. So first of all, the process, let, let's say you want to do a production rate change. Right? So you have a plant, you want a 25% increase in production. You can't get the production rate from here to here instantaneously. Because you have to, the, the, the plant or the particular process has some sort of dynamics associated with it. 
And I think you'll really gain appreciation for this when you, when you do the distillation column. I always bring that up. Because the dynamics of that thing are so slow that to go from here to here takes well over an hour. Okay? So it's a function of just the inherent dynamics of the process. You just have to live with that. You can't dramatically change that. You can't make a process that has a time constant of an hour respond in seconds. Just can't do that. Okay? So this limits how well you can do with control, right? You just can't correct problems instantaneously. If the output deviates, like in this scenario here, if the output deviates from the set point like this, it's going to take some amount of time to bring it back. You can't bring it back instantaneously. Um, the other thing is that we don't talk about this a lot in the class, but inputs have constraints, which means if you're trying to correct, so how does this normally work? Let's say you have a tank like this. So this is a storage tank. And your goal here is to, um, let's say we've got a pump here. You know that's a pump? It's not a person. It's like a, a stick person, but it's a pump. Okay. And what we're going to have here is a level controller. So you see, the goal here is to control this level. And we're going to do this by measuring the level, comparing that measurement to the desired level, and then we're going to change that pump. Right? If, it, if the level's too high, we're going to pump more out. If it's, if it's dropping, we're going to pump less out. If someone all of a sudden dumps a massive or a large amount of material in the inlet stream into this tank, there's no way to reduce the level instantly. Right? It's going to take time. How much time it takes is a function of how much the level deviates from the desired value, how big this pump is, so on and so forth. But none of this can be done instantly. Okay. And there's limits on how much you can operate this pump. Obviously, if this pump could pump an infinite amount in an infinitely short period of time, I could correct this instantaneously. But the pump has limits. Right? Limits how quickly you can change flow in the pump, limit what the maximum flow in the pump is, and this will limit our ability to control as well. So that's the, that's the second part. All right, so here's the canonical, yeah. Um, I just have a quick question. Um, on the diagram for like, one of the first slides, it said input signal is not F, and then objective defined it as an output. I was just wondering if that was like a typo or if they actually mean. Um, well, in feedback control, the output is the input to the controller. Okay. <laughs> when we do control, that's why it's called feedback. You're feeding back the measurement. Okay. So the measured signal is actually the input to the controller. It's the output of the process, but it's the input to the controller. The job of the controller is to check this feedback measurement and try to make it equal to seven. Thank you. All right. Okay. So this is the favorite example in the book. And so I stick with it because it provides at least um, continuity with the text. I don't, know, I don't think it's necessarily the most interesting example. So what are we doing in this example? We're taking fluid, putting it into a tank, heating it up, and then flowing it out. So we're trying to heat up. Wait a minute. This is wrong. This is a more interesting example. Sorry. My mistake. This is a blending system. So we have a stream coming in here. We have no control over it. It's got some, let's say, mass fraction. Let's say it's a binary mixture. It's got some mass fraction of one of the components and some mass flow rate. We have no control over these things. They come from some other unit operation, let's say. Our goal is to blend this. Blend pure A. Let's say this is a mixture of A and B, some flow rate. Our goal is to mix A. This is pure A such that we get the desired composition coming out of the tank. Okay. So we might be, for example, you could envision this as a tank. Maybe we're recycling something from a reactor that's depleted in the reactant. We're going to put more reactant in there to get the reactant composition that we want before we send it back to the reactor or something like this. All right. So this is the problem in words. Okay. So the idea is maintain the outlet composition x, that's that, at the set point, which we specify by adjusting the flow rate of the stream that has pure rate, that, that flow rate right there. Okay. So for this particular problem, 
This is called the controlled output. It's the thing we want to control. It's the composition coming out of the tank. This is called the manipulated input. Flow and pure stream. In control, you always have to have something you can manipulate in order to control something. Okay. So if this composition changes, um, I have to have something to compensate for it, and that is the manipulated input. Sometimes people think of control as, look, you look at this process, you think, what's the objective of this process to, to come up with a composition for some other unit operation? So what are you going to do? If there's variability in X, that's bad. Because the reactor wants a certain value of X to maximize yield or have stoichiometric ratios of reactants, whatever it might be. But variability in this stream is irrelevant. Right? So I'm going to take all the variability, or at least try, all the variability in X and move it to variability in W2. To shift the variability from a place that is bad for me to a place that I can put us on. Alright. So this is just terminology again. The process, when we talk about process, it means the system that we would typically be worried about if we had no control, like the, the heat exchanger, the distillation column, or the stirred tank, whatever it might be. Okay? In this case, the blending system. When you see a picture like this, this means there's a transmitter. That means the <coughs> measurements take the place. They call composition measurement AT. I don't know why. It seems like CT would be a better, better term. There. This means composition measurement. Maybe that means analyzer. I don't know. Okay, composition measurement. Okay. So that means you have to some, have some way of measuring the composition of this stream. That would typically be done by GC or something like that. Then you see a dotted line. A dotted line means this isn't a physical thing. It's a, it's a signal. You understand? This is a, this is a physical pipe with flow. And this is a, a dotted line means it's a signal, not, not, a, not a flow. So we have a measurement of what this composition is from this analyzer. We send that to a controller, AC. Again, I'm not sure about the A, but C stands for controller. Compare that to a set point, the desired value of this composition. <coughs> then we have to drive this valve. So anytime you see a picture like this, this should tell you, I can control the flow of this stream, I cannot control the flow of this stream or this stream, because they have no valves on it. So I'm going to use this, send a signal to this valve. Um, so if you've been in the lab, you should know, if you've done experiment that has anything to do with control, that valves are driven by pneumatic pressure. Okay. So for example, you try to run a heat exchanger and no one's turned on the instrument air in the laboratory, you can't run it because you need pressure to open and close these valves. Okay. So the output of this controller is some signal um, what you need to drive the valve is pressure. So you have to have some conversion here. It's called an I to P converter. It takes like the output of this controller, which might be an electrical signal, like voltage signal, milliamp signal, and changes that to a pneumatic signal, pressure, to drive the valve. Okay. You never see these because they're, they're, the they're mounted in the back of the unit. You don't even care about it, but it exists. All right. So uh, the the tra sensor transmitter, so sensor means the thing that actually transduces the signal. Transmitter means something that um, uh, maybe amplifies the signal. AT. You have a controller, call that AC. You have this converter, I to P, current pressure converter. And the final control element is the thing that actually actuates. It, it changes the manipulated variable, usually a valve, as you see here. Okay? So you get the basic idea here. And, the, and these pictures are... Like if someone said, how does this work? I'd much prefer a picture like this than to words like this. So I'm going to draw lots of pictures like this and like a flow controller. And you have to become comfortable, which I think you will, about what this is trying to say. You can say, ah, I'm measuring this composition and I'm trying to control that flow. So you can see it all in the picture. Okay. So the key thing in the course, well, there's a couple of key things. One is determining like when and how we should even do this. Like if someone says, this is my system, what should I do? Hopefully by the end of the course you'd say, well, you probably want to control the composition. And a plot like this. Whoops. It, like this is a problem where you say, you'd say, even though you might need to control the level in here, which is not shown, that's not the primary goal of the mixing system, to control the level and then just have arbitrary composition come out, right? So you should be able to say, well, I, I can tell them the most important thing is to control the composition. And I have a pure A stream, I should probably manipulate that flow. Okay. So I mean, so you, you want to learn that, but 
from a more theoretical standpoint, we're going to try to figure out what should be in this box here. That's not a box. That's a circle. What should be in this controller? What's the algorithm that takes this information and translates it into the suit? So that's the main thing we want to work on. We'll be covering that. Okay, so here's the simplest, well, the second simplest type of control. The simplest type of control <coughs> is on-off control. That's like your thermostat. Right, it has a bandwidth. Let's say you have the air conditioning on. It has a bandwidth. You set it for, uh, let's say, 72 degrees. So if the temperature is within 72 degrees, plus or minus half a degree, nothing happens. If the air conditioning is running, it keeps running. It's not running, it doesn't run. If it gets above 72.5, the AC kicks on. If it goes below 71.5, it turns off. Okay, so it's just on-off. Not a lot of technology there. Um, not good for plants. Okay? <laughs> Wouldn't be good to operate a plant with a bunch of on-off controllers. Like the valves are all open or all closed. Um, number one, it would wear the valves out because you would just be slamming them open and shut all the time. The other thing is you'd have huge variability okay. because the, I mean, if, the, if you had a flow and you had an on-off controller, the flow would tend to look like this. Right? That's not very attractive for an operator in the plant when they know the desired value is this. Okay? So we're not going to be using on-off controllers. The simplest thing we might consider is something called a proportional control. So there's that air signal I mentioned. It's going to be the difference between the set point, the, uh, set point and the measurement. Okay? It's a measure of how well the controller is doing. If it's zero, you're, it's all good. If it's not zero, control is trying to make it zero. So proportional control looks like this. So you have to remember what this p-value means. This p-value is the signal being sent to the final control element. It's the output of the controller. I'm going to have to do this to you. It's this signal here. This thing the controller is producing that eventually drives the valve for a second. Okay. It's got two parts. It's got a bias, and then it has this term that's proportional to the air. So talking about this proportional part, hopefully this makes sense, that if the air is large, you probably should do more. Right? So for example, if I'm opening a valve for this, so if we go back to the example I just gave you, the composition is too low. Okay? That means I should put more A in there. If the composition is really too low, I should really put a lot of A in there quickly. Okay? So this says the bigger the air, the more you should act. And how much you act for a given error is determined by this thing called the controller gain. It's an adjustable parameter. <coughs> you have to figure it out yourself. Or actually, I'll teach you how to figure it out. Okay. So hopefully that makes sense. Big error, act, act aggressively. This bias value just says there's probably some nominal flow of pure A when the error is zero. Okay. So in other words, if there's zero error, that doesn't usually correspond that you want zero flow. So that the bias value is out compensates for that. Okay? So hopefully this makes some sense to you. Proportional controller, simplest thing we can consider. Down here I'm just doing due diligence and specifying how you, how you uh, represent this as a transfer function. Alright, so I'm going to represent, because transfer functions mean deviation variable, so I'm going to specify or define something called P prime. It's the difference between the actual value of P controller output minus this nominal value, P bar, is bias value. Okay, that means I can write the equation like this. Right? You can think of this error as already being deviation values because it's, it's already a y minus a y, so we don't, we don't need to do anything with that. Okay, so there is the controller equation. The same thing as this, except written in this deviation form. Not a big leap of faith. Okay, now I'm going to take the Laplace transform. This is just an algebraic equation. So when you take the Laplace transform, this just becomes P, capital P prime of S, and this becomes capital E of S. There's no derivatives, so there's no S introduced or anything of the kind. So when we talk about a controller transfer function, so let's back up a second. When we talked about process transfer function at the beginning of the class, we, could, we wrote it like this, Y of S, equal g of s times u of s. Right? There's the input, it goes to this transfer function, to be the output. <coughs> or sometimes we would prefer to write it like this. Okay. That was called the transfer function. That's the process transfer function. Okay. <coughs> Same thing with the controller here. Okay. 
This tells you that for the controller, the input is the air signal, the difference between the, out, the set point and the measurement. And the output is the signal you're going to send to the valve or whatever the final control element is. So we could write it like this, or we could write it like this. Okay. Now, if we write it like the second case, this is saying, here's the output of the controller, here's the input to the controller, and this is called the controller transfer function. We'll give it a little subscript C to differentiate it from this one. Because okay. we want you to know there's a difference in the controller transfer function and the process transfer function. For a PI controller, as derived up there, it's simply the controller game. That's all it is. It's a concept. Okay? So you'll have to think about this probably a little bit. But the idea is that if I tell you something's a proportional controller, that means you can either write it like that if it's convenient to you in the time domain, or you can write it like this if it's convenient to write it in the little box domain if you don't want to do the same thing. Okay, so if you look at the equation, you should be able to conclude that it looks something like this. Right? So here's the um, air signal, here's the controller output. When the air signal is zero, you get the value of P bar, and as long as Kc is positive, then it, it has a slope that looks like it's the slope of Kc and looks like that. Right? Um, the idea here is that if you have an actual controller, there's a limit on um, what, the, what the controller can actually implement. So if you're sending a signal to the valve, you know, you can, you can close the valve and close the valve and close the valve, but eventually the valve's completely closed. That's what I call the T-min. You can open the valve until it's fully open, that's what I call the T-max. In other words, it's linear within a range, and then eventually you can't change it anymore. So this depicts again, so the slope of this line, even though not indicated here, here is Kc. This implies Kc is a positive value. Kc is not always positive. So let's think about that um, system. Maybe we can think about this system here. Okay, see this controller here? here here's, my, here's my hypothesis. Okay, you can always figure out what sign the controller gain would be just from the physics of the process. Okay. So, let, so here's what the air signal is. Okay. So for our problem, let's say we're actually sort of controlling the level. So that means the air is the desired value of the level minus the measured value of the level. Okay. Let's say this air is positive. Okay. That means the level is less than it should be. Right. <coughs> So if the level is less than you should be, do you think you want to pump more fluid out of this tank or less? It's a challenging question. Level is, let's say, going down. It'll be less, right? Pump less fluid out of it. So that means that for this problem, the Kc is actually negative. Because what does the controller do? It multiplies the air by a proportionality constant and then changes the of the pump. If Kc was positive and this was positive, then you would increase the pump when the level was dropping. That would, that would result in you emptying the tank. Okay. So because in this case, you want air goes up, you need the input to go down. Which means how much you pump. So Kc is actually negative in this case. So for each case, um, it's different. It might be positive, it might be negative. You have to look at the physics of the problem to know which it should be. All right. So all right, well, this is simple. Multiply the error by a proportionality constant, add a bias value, change the pump, or change, change the valve. OK, why, <coughs> why is this not the end of the story? This is a pretty short story. Um, I'm going to come, well, maybe we should go through this at this point. Um, so proportional control is nice, but it doesn't eliminate something we call offset. So if I'm to, let's say, implement a set point change, 
which means I'm going to take my set point, the desired value of the output, and change it like this. Okay, that's the set point. If you have a proportional only controller, it's very common you'll see something that looks like this. Why will do that? In other words, they why won't ever get to the desired value. That that is called offset. And that's bad. Because you have a set point for a reason. It's what you want the value to be. Like this is the desired value of the level, it's the actual value. They're not the same. It's not good. What happens? If you go into a plant, they'll have these big distributed control systems and all these measurements will be being shown to the operators. If the operator sees this behavior, he will call you. Um, or he'll turn the controller off entirely and just control it himself. Okay, because this indicates controller's not working. I mean, if you consistently see the output not equal to the set point, or maybe not even that close to it, that's not working, right? So this is a problem. Okay. It could be okay, like for, I say for liquid level, because the liquid level, the primary concern is that the tank not be too empty or too full. So if the level wandered around and wasn't equal to the set point, it might be okay, but I think most operators would still not like it. Okay. And you have to understand, the way plants work, you can be a chemical engineer, a process engineer, a control engineer, but you do not operate the plant. The, the operations people, meaning operators, operate the plant. And um, you have to do things they understand and things that they um, will use, otherwise it just falls into service or it's just not used at all. Okay. So this isn't going to be good. So what we're going to do is combine this proportional control. So this is what I mean by one mode of control. One mode is called proportional control. We're going to combine this with something called interval control. Okay. So in, additional, in addition to the input being proportional to the air itself, it's going to be proportional to the interval of the air. And that's going to eliminate offset. That'll make sure that this doesn't occur. Okay. So that's the next slide right there. How are we doing? All right, so this is, this is the one and only reason you would use interval control. Okay. Um, I knew someone that worked for a company to be unnamed because I don't want to denigrate them. He went to a plant and he found that someone had turned off all the interval control in the plant so that none of the outputs were ever equal to the set points in this whole plant. That's why he was there. And he was like, how do you turn on the interval mode? And then and he left. <laughs> so... Um, <laughs> All right, so the, the reason we use integral is to make sure that the output, for example, would be changed, the set point would be changed like this, the output will eventually get there. Okay. So this is called a pure integral controller. It looks just like what we saw before. So here's the single <coughs> sense of the final controller element, like the valve. You have a bias value. And now you have a term that's proportional to the integral of the air instead of the air directly. The proportionality constant may look weird, right? Instead of it's one, why don't you call it Ki, for example? Well, it's traditional to call it 1 over tau i, because that's a certain interpretation. But it's all a proportionality constant. And this thing, this tau i is called the interval time. It has units of time. I should have mentioned earlier that Kc has, always has units of the input over the output. In other words, it's the opposite um, units that K has, right? Because KC takes the output and converts it into the input. So whatever the input is, like this might be a flow, so it might be liters per hour, and the input might be temperature, degree C, okay? So whatever the output you're dealing with, whatever the input is, this is the units KC will have. Units of this integral time is always time. Okay, it could be seconds, hours, minutes, minutes, hours, minutes. Okay. And so this is a pure integral controller. We don't actually use that typically, but I'll, I'll explain it anyway. So now what I want to do, just like I did with proportional controllers, I want to tell you what is the Laplace transform of this controller. That way, if I tell you something's an integral controller and you have a trans, you're working in Laplace domain, you can just directly write the transfer function for it. So all I've done in this step is bring P bar over here and define the difference between that and that to be P prime, just like on the other slide. So P prime equals that. 
Now, take Laplace transform on both sides of the equation, which just becomes p prime of s. 1 over tau is just a constant, and you have to maybe go back to the notes, but if you look at what is the Laplace transform of an integral, okay, <coughs> 1 over s times the Laplace transform of an integrand. So just so we're all on the same page here. We have Laplace transform of interval, I guess we can write the same thing here, uh, e, t, 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 for example. That's going to be 1 over s Laplace transform of e. So integration in the time domain is equivalent to 1 over s in the Laplace domain. It's one reason Laplace is so convenient. Like, right, a derivative in the Laplace domain is s, and integration in the Laplace domain is 1 over s. It's quite convenient. OK, so when you get this, obviously, you can rearrange it to get p prime, the output of the controller, over e, which is the input of the controller. That's the controller transfer function. So for a pure interval controller, it's this, 1 over tau i s. All right? Okay, so that's the good, so the good news is the following. I'm not going to prove this. I, I guess I could, but we don't prove things in this course. This will get rid of offset. Okay. So change the output set point. The output will get from there to there. The problem is if you do integral control alone, it'll get there, it'll usually be really, really, really slow. <coughs> So it solves one problem and introduces a new problem. It solves the problem and gets rid of the offset. It creates a new problem that's too slow by itself. So what you normally do is combine this with uh, proportional control. And I'll stop after this slide here. Um, clearly going the wrong direction, but I just keep doing it. Okay. Okay, cool. All right, so usually we're going to use something like this. <coughs> it's just a combination of the two. Right? So it's a controller that has both a proportional part and an interval part. Like, if you like the fact this one's fast and this one gets rid of offset, then why not put them together and get the best of both worlds? Fast and get rid of offset. Okay. You can see that it's common that both these terms are multiplied by the controller gain. So the controller gain multiplies the uh, proportional part and the interval part. Not always, but that's the way it's written here. All right, now as a final thing, we can find the Laplace transform of this equation. How do we do it? Well, bring this over here to get p prime, we get this. Now take the Laplace transform of both sides of the equation. This will be the p prime of s. Here you have the constant k times Laplace transform of this guy. So you get one term involving just e of s, right? Laplace transform, that's where the 1 comes from. Then you get another term involving 1 over tau i s i z. This is the second term. This is just the thing I did before put together. There's the proportional part, there's the animal part, not multiplied by kc. That's how this equation is written. And so that means the, uh, trans the controller transfer function for a PI controller, right? The input is the air, the output is signal sent to the final control element. GC is this thing right here. So if I tell you something's a PI controller, proportional interval control, it means you can write that if you want in the time domain, or you can just write it like that if you prefer to do it on the Laplace domain. Most times when we do the